Hi, I'm Elizabeth, and today we're going to talk about night sweats. So I tend to work with um, moms who have, I'm going to say relatively young kids, not obviously infants or babies or anything, but you know, more when kids are starting to sleep through the night. And so that might mean that I work with moms from, you know, mid to late twenties up until probably about mid forties. And night sweats are very much a symptom of menopause, which doesn't typically happen in your early to mid forties. Typically it can. But the problem is, is that night sweats can also be associated with perimenopause. Now, menopause is defined as when you have had no period, so no menstrual cycle for a full calendar year. So it's been 12 months without any cycle. And that is the definition of menopause. But perimenopause, which is that lovely little period leading up to menopause, can last for up to 10 years. The age at which a woman hits menopause is going to differ greatly, but is very much tied to the age at which your mother had experienced menopause. So if your mother experienced menopause in her maybe mid to late forties, which is a little typically on the earlier side, um, you might start experiencing perimenopausal symptoms in your late thirties to early forties. That's entirely possible. So even if you're not in menopause and you don't think you're in perimenopause yet, um, but maybe you've started to notice changes in your sleep or you're starting to notice changes in your, um, temperature at night or maybe even around your cycle. So that's also something that can happen is that as a woman creeps up closer to perimenopause, um, her sleep might be fine, her, but maybe when she is kind of PMSing or experiencing her period, that's when sleep can get disrupted with hormones and night sweats can happen. So I'm giving you this information as both a potential treatment, if that's what you're experiencing right now, but also major, major prevention. Because if your mom experienced night sweats a lot, it's very likely that you will also experience them. And there's a lot that you can do to kind of set yourself up now to prevent them and to kind of get ahead of them. So let's talk about night sweats. Menopause is a completely normal part of a woman's reproductive cycle. It happens to everyone, but the symptoms that are often associated with menopause, including night sweats, are not what I would consider normal. They're very common. They happen to almost everyone, but it's partly because our endocrine system and our hormones are a little bit off from where they should be. We get hormones from all sorts of, they're called exogenous sources, so external sources. Um, it throws our system off and it's very possible for lots of women in other parts, North America, it's very common for women to experience symptoms, but it's also very common in other parts of the world for women to just enter menopause without even noticing. Obviously you notice there are going to be changes, um, but not to the same degree that a lot of women in North America are used to. And so I just want to start there by saying that because a lot of these symptoms can be driven by things that are happening in our environment and then within us, there's a lot that we can do to control it. Symptoms of perimenopause and menopause, and in particular night sweats, because that's what we're talking about right now, start to show up when hormones start to change. And really what happens is estrogen and progesterone, two of the key female sex hormones, start to drop off as we age. And so when we see sleep disruptions and night sweats, it's because those hormones tend to drop. They may pick back up again if you're, you know, if you're still having a cycle, but they do tend to drop and that's where the symptoms come in. So what are the things that can aggravate night sweats? The list is pretty long and it can be very individual. So what might be a trigger for you or, you know, your might be different than it was from your friend. But here are the top things that I see that can aggravate night sweats for women. Exhaustion and stress. So I've talked about stress a lot. You can go back and check out my previous videos. But when your body is in a state of constant stress, that can really aggravate menopause. Uh, that, can, that can really aggravate menopausal symptoms. Anxiety physical inactivity, what we eat and drink. So hot drinks can aggravate night sweats. Spicy food can aggravate them. Alcohol and caffeine are two significant contributors. Things like chocolate, sugar, red meat, dairy, all of those foods can aggravate night sweats. Smoking can aggravate night sweats. The weather, we're, I mean, that might seem self-explanatory, but on a really hot day or a really hot night, you might be more prone to night sweats. 
your maternal history. So what your mother's experience or your grandmother's experience was with night sweats might be similar to what you experience. Some medications can aggravate, um, can aggravate night sweats. And something else to kind of keep an eye out for is thyroid function. So if your thyroid is on the lower side, the slower side, which is considered hypothyroidism, I've talked a little bit about that too, but if you're interested, I can do more about that. But if your thyroid is a little bit on the slow side, uh, that can really aggravate symptoms of menopause, including night sweats. So what to do about them? There are actually a lot of things that you can tweak about your diet, your lifestyle, your habits right now that can kind of set you up for a relatively smooth sailing through menopause. So all of the things that I talk about all the time are really important foundational things. So getting good night's sleep, regular movement, eating well, all of those things are key for helping us sail through menopause. In particular with the exercise, so moving every day is really important for a number of reasons, but getting some sort of movement every day is really, is really exceptionally valuable to help prevent night sweats. When we talk about food, so avoiding the triggers, right? So those triggers may be very individual to you. The big triggers that do tend to affect a lot of people, like I just mentioned, so spicy foods, alcohol, caffeine, chocolate, sugar, red meat, dairy, all of those, if you can limit those, you might find that one of them is exceptionally bad for you, or you might be able to eat red meat and not notice anything, but avoiding those foods are gonna be really helpful. And then if you have any other specific foods that are a trigger for you. Cruciferous vegetables. So one of the things that we wanna make sure we're addressing in perimenopause and menopause is proper hormone production and detoxification. Cruciferous vegetables, which include broccoli, cauliflower, um, Brussels sprouts, kale, all of those have wonderful compounds um, from a couple of perspectives. So from a fiber, but also from an estrogen metabolism perspective, they have really important compounds that are going to help balance your hormones. So making sure that you're getting a good serving of cruciferous vegetables every day can really help improve hot flashes and other symptoms of menopause phytoestrogens is also something I need to talk about. So when I talked about your hormones dropping, so that's estrogen and progesterone that are going to kind of be on the downside. Phytoestrogens is a compound that is found in food that can help modulate estrogen. So a lot of women have symptoms that are associated with high levels of estrogen. That's very normal because in our environment, we tend to be exposed to um, well, normal estrogen plus also um, external estrogens that I'll talk about in a second. So if you have symptoms of high estrogen, phytoestrogens can kind of turn that volume down a little bit. But on the flip side, if you have symptoms of low estrogen, so like night sweats or hot flashes, adding phytoestrogens can turn that volume up and help mitigate those symptoms. So two of the main sources of phytoestrogens that I recommend a lot are soy and flaxseed. About 20 to 60 grams of an isolated soy protein for about six to 12 weeks can really help reduce hot flashes, but just increasing your um, like tofu and tempeh and soy milk in your diet can help. And one of the things that I prescribe, I recommend a lot is flaxseed. Two tablespoons of ground flaxseed every day, sprinkle on salads or yogurt or in a smoothie or anything like that can really help to reduce the symptoms of night sweats. With flaxseed, a couple things. So flaxseed is a very, very great source of omega-3. Omega-3 is a really unstable fat typically. And so always buy whole flaxseed and grind it yourself. Eating whole flaxseed is not gonna get you the fats that you want. The fats that you need are inside. So you need to crack, and that shell, the flaxseed shell is not digestible. So you gotta kind of crack open that shell to access the fat. But also don't just grind a bunch of them and then let them sit because all that really good fat's gonna oxidize. So ideally you'll grind fresh. You can use like a, a coffee grinder is a really good option, or I have like a, a magic bullet that I grind flaxseeds in. That really works too. So ideally you'll grind two tablespoons at a time and use that through the day but you can also grind maybe a quarter of a cup or or half a cup grind it up and put it in the freezer and then you have enough for a few days at a time without having to grind it every day but the, the freezer will help to stabilize those really healthy important fats a vitamin b complex can be really helpful especially focusing on vitamin b6 so vitamin b6 is an excellent vitamin to help support um, adrenal function and stress metabolism actually 
fiber. So making sure you have enough fiber in your diet. So the flax seeds are going to help with that. Cruciferous vegetables are going to help with that. But also just bulking up on really fibrous foods, um, you know, beans and lentils and uh, vegetarian proteins, healthy grains, lots of other different color veggies. All of those are going to help add fiber to your diet. Stress. Okay, let's talk about stress for a quick second. Because in with regards to stress, always stress regulation, stress management, stress modulation is all very important. And so the things I've talked about with stress, I've got lots of resources on that, but the key things are moving, moving every day can help lower your stress, deep breathing exercises or mindfulness exercises, yoga, journaling, um, getting together with friends, kind of a, you know, a community creating music, dancing, laughing, all of those things are going to help reduce your stress levels. And so those are all important and I would consider them prescriptions when it comes time to uh, to addressing perimenopause and menopausal symptoms. But the one thing I kind of want to explain about stress is in Chinese medicine, there are two energies, there's yin and yang. Yang energy is very high, hot, fast. It's a very masculine energy. It's a very tall, um, kind of very productive energy. Yin is exactly the opposite. It's slow, it's cold, it's a very feminine energy, it's a low energy. And through our lives, we need a balance of the two. Young kids, infants, babies are very young. So if you ever, well, you've had kids, but if you're ever watching uh, a toddler or a kid move around, it's exhausting. Like there's no way you could physically keep up with them. It's a very young movement, but we try, we try our entire lives to keep up with that pace. It's go, 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 go. But the reality is, is that when you look at the other end of the age spectrum, so if you know anyone who's in their, I don't know, 80s, 90s, even 100, they are a lot slower. Their movements are slower, their activity is lower, and that's totally normal. And as we age, we tend to need more of that energy, that slower, restorative yin energy in our lives. And so in Chinese medicine, hot flashes and menopausal symptoms are, this is more complicated than I'm making it, but are considered to be part of a yin deficiency picture. So you don't have enough yin in your life. And to build more yin, you need to do exactly that. You need to slow down. Relaxation. So even exercise, when I'm talking about exercise and, you know, getting that in every day, that doesn't need to be a really crazy, vigorous workout that's going to be very young, very hot, very fast, very productive. Yin exercises like yin yoga, stretching, qigong, tai chi, all of those kind of slower restorative exercises are really, really helpful. So just generally slowing down, lowering your stress levels, building in more time for things that you find relaxing. It's not just about the stress. It's about moving into this phase of more yin that's needed in your life, more, more relaxation, more slowness that's needed in your life, which is just part of the natural cycle of energy. So I always like to explain that to keep that in mind, that there is a space for this hot, productive, fast moving, young energy. But there's also a really important space for this yin energy. And if you think of society right now, um, women included, we're all expected to just go, 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 produce, produce, produce all the time. And so making sure that you build in time to not be doing that is a really, really important balance for your energy, for your hormones, and just for your overall health. Perimenopause and menopause can be a really good time to get your thyroid checked. So like I just mentioned, um, th low thyroid function can aggravate hot flashes and night sweats. So you can check with your doctor to make sure your thyroid is functioning okay. And if that's not the case, you can talk to them about treating it. And one other thing I want to talk about is xenoestrogens. So I just mentioned that we're exposed to estrogens in a variety of ways all over the place. And xenoestrogens are one of those not so great sources. Phytoestrogen, I also mentioned, that's the estrogen that we get a lot from food that kind of helps to modulate the symptoms. Uh, yeah, xenoestrogen is an estrogen that comes from our environment that looks like estrogen, acts like estrogen, but isn't estrogen. So it artificially puts our body into a high estrogen picture and it can totally throw our endocrine system off. The sources of xenoestrogens that you do want to avoid, plastic is a huge one. So with plastic, if you can avoid it at all costs, that is incredible. Now, as I say that, I realize that plastic is everywhere. So here are the things that you can think about. 
not eating with plastic cutlery, right? So using real stainless steel cutlery, um, storing extra or leftover food in glass jars or containers. There's lots of glass options available for you now. If you are storing food in plastic, heat it on like a plate or in a glass container never ever heat in plastic and ideally you're not going to freeze in plastic i say that because that's exceptionally difficult to do if you're freezing stuff there's not a lot of really great glass freezing systems um you can freeze things in mason jars it's harder but um as much as you can avoid those temperature extremes with plastic that can be really helpful avoid plastic water bottles so drink from a glass or a glass water bottle there's so many options for glass water bottles out there but just avoiding plastic as much as you can is going to be really helpful bpa or bisphenol a is another big culprit you're going to see a lot of plastic that has bpa in it or it'll or sorry you'll see a lot of plastic that will say bpa free bpa used to be a thing that was that helped to make plastic hard there's now it's all bpa free Honestly, it's still plastic. It might not be BPA in there. It might be something else that's making the plastic hard. So avoiding plastic, but BPA is that kind of slippery thing on receipts that you get at the store. Um, there are gonna be lots of plastic sources that have BPA. So you wanna avoid those as much as you can. Cosmetics can also be a really big source of xenoestrogens. So things like lotions, shampoos, um, makeup, anything like that is going to have chemicals in it that can act as an estrogen in your body. A really good resource is the Skin Deep uh, database by the Environmental Working Group. So you can go on there and you can check out any of the cosmetics, the soaps, the lotions, the shampoos that you use and see kind of where they rate on the scale. It's a wonderful database that it lets you know kind of, um, yeah, how things are gonna be impacting you. But avoiding xenoestrogens, getting the cleanest cosmetics that you can is absolutely gonna be beneficial to you. And the last thing that I'm gonna say about night sweats is in regards to hormone replacement therapy. Now, HRT or hormone, hormone replacement therapy is something that your medical doctor can prescribe to you um, as you're going into menopause. So this is not something that if you're in perimenopause, I wouldn't reach out to your doctor. But I wanna talk about this a little bit because starting HRT at the right time is really important. A lot of women will go through symptoms of perimenopause and kind of brush them off and then get into the symptoms of menopause. Although if it, it still may not be menopause because if it hasn't been one full calendar year since their period stopped and they still might brush some things off. And finally, it's been a year and they think, okay, I'm in menopause. It's time for my hormone replacement therapy because my hot sweats are, or my, because my night sweats are terrible and my hot flashes are awful and I've got all these other symptoms. The best time to start HRT is actually before you're fully in menopause. So when your um, hormones kind of start to dip and then to add HRT in to kind of bring them back up without that drastic drop and then that drastic increase again you want to avoid that drastic dip and and back up if you're starting hormone replacement therapy at the wrong time it can actually increase your risk of things like cardiovascular disease um, and other things that i'm not going to name because i can't remember them off the top of my head but make sure you have a talk with your doctor so if your mother had a lot of symptoms around perimenopause and menopause and or you're already experiencing symptoms and it, you know you haven't really started any of them yet or um you feel like you've got a high kind of estrogen picture if you feel like hormone replacement therapy is something that you're going to want to look into talk to your doctor about it as early as you can because you want to make sure that you avoid that massive drop in hormones and then that pick back up you want to try and keep them as smooth as possible so it's something that your doctor can kind of monitor you for um to watch your hormones there is a point at which the hormones will they, they know the numbers there's a point at which they'll go down and they're not going to come back up so talking to your doctor about this in advance and and using hrt in the most optimal way possible is going to help improve your health just from a symptom perspective but also from a risk factor perspective so have a chat with your doctor about that earlier than later to make sure you're on the same page and make sure that you can use those at the optimal time so those are my recommendations around night sweats. A lot of what I do and a lot of what I talk about is about the foundations for this anyhow. So if sleep for right now is still a challenge for you, whether it's from night sweats or otherwise, 
send me a message, comment below. I'm happy to help. Um, finding your food triggers as well. So I mentioned alcohol, caffeine, chocolate, all of those things. But if you have any specific food triggers that you're kind of curious about, send me a note because that's also something that I can help with. I hope this was helpful. It's a lot of information. So take some time to digest it. If you have any questions, please feel free, free to reach out. And I hope you have a great day.